We are the Suze family. Lay your head on this. It will automatically just come into your brain. I can read Hindi. Four years ago, we embarked on an adventure to carve out a life in India to tell small stories about the way India has helped us see the world differently. The reason Ford has to eat really fast is because it's going to be on the TV you have your pin behind you. I know, that's that's I've what I'm saying. No, I did it on purpose, it's my trademark. I wrote out my three points, and so I had them there, and I was able to say them. Upon completing four years and about 400 videos made in or about India, we thought it would be fun to take today's episode and look back at what we've seen, felt, and learned. Yes, what? I know. What's that? This is the Palace of Bubbles. Two years ago, we made a feature film recapping our first two years of carving out a life in India, so you can kind of think of today's episode of American Indian as a short film sequel to that film. American potato salad for 4th of July, Independence Day, and then aloo gobi, and together they form a more perfect union. No! Together they form a more perfect union. Do it, for it. The world is depending on you. Oh, come on. So it's a four-year, 400-video remix complete with some of our favorite memories. We just survived an inferno together. Some memories that never made it into video edited form for previous viewing. And answers to some frequently asked questions on today's retrospective edition of American Indian. We're an American family living in India. We love food, film, language, culture, and making new friends. Join our adventures from America to India and beyond. My friend Alan Branch asked, what's one of the most beautiful memories you have of India? I think generally one of the weekends that stands out in my mind is a visit to a place called Patan Mahal. It was just beautiful. I made a video about that. That's just one of the most beautiful vista kind of experiences, most relaxing things that I've had happen in India. I think what Alan meant with that question is like a beautiful moment. So for me, the most beautiful favorite moment, the Ram Leela celebration. So when I was a kid, I would climb stuff. I would climb stuff that you're not supposed to climb. I'd get up in trees and climb walls and stuff like that. Uh, so I just thought it was really cool this kid climbed the wall. And then this old uncle was there too. Quintessential India kind of moment. The good side of India kind of moment, I feel like. And why festivals are so loved in India. Someone had asked about that. Why didn't you show Ravan actually burning? Well, there's a funny story about that. I think I just ran out of time. So the lines of the other two effigies had fallen down and burnt the lines of the Ravan. So before they could even light him up, he fell over. Thankfully, nobody was there when it fell over. I don't know. There were, we were so packed in there. I don't know how that thing didn't fall on somebody. But it fell over. So I had to light him up on the ground. But I don't know why I didn't show that, but that's what happened. They lit up Robin on the ground. I have this one memory of walking down the street near our second apartment. Along the side of the road were several press wallows in a row. And so this one press wallow's little daughter, she had to be maybe three, was just sitting there on the ground playing with something. And uh, one of the wedding horses rode by, just a guy on the back of a big white horse rode by. And she looked up at the horse coming and she just followed him down the street and was just chanting horse in Hindi. Gora, 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 Gora. It was just such a cute little memory. My second favorite memory is when we had people over to watch uh, one baseball and one cricket movie. Uh, we had a little spontaneous cricket session with Rohan and Rohan was bowling the ball. Oh! <laughs> he didn't even look. It was a lot of fun. We were all amazed at what he could do, and it was just great. All right, that, I was standing there thinking, I love my life right now. Run, take your, take your run, take your run. first few months in India, we went to a water park called Fun and Food Village, and we had a lot of fun there, and there was one particular slide that um, stood out. It was me, Dad, and Anjali, and it was this gigantic slide. It went like, whirl, 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 and we went down it so fast, and Anjali almost fell off, and it was so, so fun. Is there anything you especially miss from India when you're in the U.S.? Mm, my house. You do miss your house? I love my house. 
I have been attached to it for many years now. Two years now, yes. Many years. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Like advertising the Coke. Hey, Rohan, tell us what Wodart is. Wodart. Yeah, what, what is Wodart? I just found that footage. Can you tell us what it is? Can you tell us what Wodart is? Tell, tell the audience what Wodart is? Hmm? Well, can you? <laughs> no? You're not going to tell us what Wodart is? So there you there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. It is confirmed. Robot is Wodart. Just his way of pronouncing. I guess he's having hard with hard time with the R at the beginnings. Well, you can say race car. So. Okay, so Rohan, tell us what is your favorite thing about India so far. Those are your two favorite things about India, cars and autos? Autos. Autos. That's number one. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Sit back down. We autos see motorcycle. You like the motorcycles too? I like motorcycles. I'm going to find motorcycles. Oh, he's going to go find it. Motorcycles! Since we made the American Indian film, we've had some great opportunities to start some new projects. Chief among them being Holly Bolly, thanks to Noble Luke. It was his idea. He's like, why don't you do honest trailers in India? Use your movie trailer voice thing. I was like, I don't know why I thought of doing that before. The Krish 3 one actually went viral by my standards. I mean, 200,000 views for me at this point is, is considered viral. Which led to meeting Anand Singh and the Viral Fever. We started some collaborations there. The real main collaboration being Jungle Raj. Kind of a parody on the type of bad politicians. And the time with TVF led to some collaborations with some awesome YouTubers and other talent all across India. I was able to meet Trouble Seeker Team, India's number one prankster duo. And we got to hang out at YouTube Fan Fest this year. We have a vanity man. AC man. Yeah. You are Is the she... fourth biggest fangirl I've Is met. She... I mean, this weekend. She just said yes. Yeah, let's do it. I actually did a collaboration with Bethany. Can you believe that? You did. You just, yeah. you just did. Yeah. Even if it's a seven-second video, I'm gonna upload it. No way. No way. I'm here. Wow. And one of the highlights of the last few years was being able to host a Bangalore Comic Con. Sitting on stage with actors from Game of Thrones. That's that was a pretty big deal. Interviewing an Indian-American NASA scientist who pilots the Mars space rover. That's, that was a pretty big deal to me. From Bangalore Comic Con YouTube, this is the Serving Violinist. Until tomorrow, keep it creative, keep it cross-cultural, and keep it constructive YouTube. Thank you very much. Collaborating also provides the opportunity to observe how an Indian works, you know, and not in a generalized sense, but just see how specific individual Indians deal with specific problems, business problems or otherwise. So one of my friends, Arun, who I met back in Noida, he works at Samsung there in Noida, and just seeing his pluck, I think that term is what I think of when I think some of some of these guys, just seeing his pluck, just facing problems with the spunky sort of Ah, we'll get it done, you know? Like, it's it's gonna be okay. Um, it's it's a little bit different from Jugar, which Melissa's gonna talk about in a minute. And a lot of times, I just, I hit one wall and that's it for me. Like, I just, until I get over that wall, I'm not doing anything else. Like, forget it, I'm gonna go pout in the corner. Working with TVF, too, just seeing how Arunab, the dude, like, the man, one of the most influential people in YouTube, in India, seeing him deal with certain setbacks, his car stereo getting uh, ripped off, I mean, like never sleeping, just seeing the simplicity of the way that he lives in spite of the success that he has found was inspiring to me. Seeing Golu deal with the internet going out and not losing it like I would. You know, the, the AC breaking and leaking water on the floor. And they're just dealing with it. While they're making, you know, four, five, six videos, they're, they're multitasking, taking care of this stuff and not letting it get them down. And that pluck, I feel, found very inspiring. Something that I admire in India is that they'll make it happen. I remember one time seeing a Scooty 
on a cycle rickshaw along with two passengers. So obviously the scooty had broken down with a driver and passenger on it. I really admire that. They'll make it happen. Pretty much the first question that we get asked, the most frequently asked question that we get is why India? Why choose India? You're an American living in America. Why would you go to India? We've actually posted an entire video uh, with some of the reasons why we chose to move to India. But the answer to that question has changed over time. In 2002, when I first went to India, my whole picture of India was skewed. I, I feel like it was off. I came with a pretty much of a colonialist attitude thinking that I could help India. I'd read a few paragraphs about India and I thought, oh, I'm the guy for the job to help India enter the 21st century or something like that. I had some experiences that showed me that I wasn't all I was cracked up to be. I had a lot to learn about myself and I had a lot to learn about India. I'm gonna save the why, the answer to that why question, till the end. Just know that it has changed over time. Why not the rest of India? Right now, we're a small startup company, and so Delhi is where we live, and therefore, that's where we're gonna film. And Delhi's a really big city, and it's the capital of India, and it has a lot to offer us for culture learning, learning about India, and experiencing India. Unless you guys want to personally fund a trip to come see you, you can pay for the surfing violinist and his family to come and visit you, and then we will film your city. Um, things I miss from home are family, friends, Chick-fil-A, buffalo sauce, Blue Dr. Sauce. Pepper, yeah. I miss central heat and air, and I will always miss central heat and air. I think they are a wonderful thing and a great invention, and everyone in India should have them as well. I do miss dryers, but I don't at the same time. Dryers are nice because then you can get your laundry done really fast. If it's hot season in India, you can also get your laundry done really fast. But I'm just like, oh yeah, this is just how it is. I think the best meal that I've had in my four years was at the Imperial Hotel in Agra when we went to visit the Taj. And it was amazing. These delicious veggies, delicious chicken. It was just, that's what jumps to my mind when I say best meal. Best music up. I'm always going, I'm a broken record. I'm gonna stick with my man, A.R. Rahman. Best live music will always be Cavalli's. I love Cavalli's. I'm partial to them. <laughs> scariest moments I've had in the past four years of living in India was with my daughter. We were at the first apartment we lived in in Noida and there was a 24-hour pharmacy just around the corner from our apartment. But we all got on a rickshaw together. The rickshaws in Noida, the, this little seat on the back that people can squeeze on. So we get there, get our stuff that we're getting from the pharmacy. We're on the rickshaw. He starts pushing us backward and there's a lip at the edge of the parking lot where it meets the road and we don't make it over. So he decides He's gonna back up, throw all his weight into pushing the rickshaw backward. Rather than the wheels going up the, that little part of the road, the rickshaw stopped and all that weight went over and we fell onto our daughters. Now, I've never had a more frightening experience in my life, except for maybe surfing with my daughter one time when she wasn't ready. This though was probably scarier because me and my friend's weight were what could crush our daughters. And so we thought that their legs were just gonna buckle, that we were gonna land on their legs and just crack their legs in half. I mean, I really thought that that's what was gonna happen. That was the most frightening feeling because there's nothing you could do. I mean, it's just we're just falling backwards on top of them. And then we look down at their leg and they just have these little tiny scrapes on their knees. Like, I have no idea how that works. I just, I don't even get it. When you first go to India, you'll have these like scary, you know, horror stories or whatever about India. Like this wasn't an India thing. This was just a weird coincidence. You know, this was just one of those things that happens. I'm happened here on the beach, just down the road when I took my daughter out to go surfing. Uh, and we, f and she fell off the board and I lost her in the water for a minute. I mean, for, you know, six seconds, but it was like six seconds of sheer terror. So that was my scariest moment in India for sure. So tell me, do you remember the faded rickshaw incident when we were back in Noida? Yeah, the so, one that I almost broke my knee. Yeah, so what? tell us what it was like. It was really scary. I thought I was going to die. 
Yeah, like, so so how did it happen? I still cannot get it through my head. Like, how did all of our weight landing on y'all's knees not... Did your knees like, just okay. scrape the ground? Or, like, how, no, what like, happened? My knee, like, made contact with the metal bars and, like, twisted it. So you pulled your knees up? Is that what happened? or? I don't know, but, like, I, I somehow banged my knee into the bars and it got sort of twisted. And I couldn't move it until you guys lifted it up. Oh, my gosh. But so your knees weren't on the ground, though? Mm -mm, my feet were. Your feet were on the ground? Yeah. I cannot get the geometry of how this worked right. But did, it didn't hurt your legs in that way then? Like it, your feet didn't get hurt? Mm -mm. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. One way that India has inspired me is it inspired me to get out and see the city I live in. For some reason, I have to leave Delhi. I don't want to have any regrets about not seeing this or that. Last summer got me into my mini adventure mode is now what I call what I go out and do. So I love going out on my little mini adventures. By doing my mini adventures in India, it's inspired me to do it here in America as well. I met a guy who flies airplanes, and so he took me and a couple of girls up for a flight. It was a fun little mini adventure. Ford has been inspired to create by India and actually to start writing some of his own music. And so he has written a couple songs. During our first couple years in India, Ford was really inspired by the whole poverty question and debate to write a song called Pay the Tax. And then this past year when we went to visit Tuglakabad Fort, he was inspired to write a song called Tuglak. been sexually harassed in India by a guy who delivered my microwave oven, uh, by a guy in the domestic terminal who was a baggage cart pusher, and uh, by street kids, beggar kids twice. So the first two times I didn't really realize what, and then the second time I did go over and slap the guy. Uh, and then with the beggar kids I did grab the one boy and grabbed his hand and pinched him. I was like, no. Thankfully, I've been able to move beyond those instances pretty quickly. Uh, you know, they didn't really bother me for probably more than a couple days, and then you move on. It, it does help me to think and prepare for the next time. Okay, I will slap the guy, and but this time I'll also grab his ear and drag and demand to see his manager or something like that, if, if I could. Street kids, there's... It's only if you can catch them. <laughs> can you do anything? about it. It hasn't happened frequently, and I've been able to kind of quickly forget it, I guess. In order to address the why India question, I've developed a little chart that I think will be helpful to understand some common mistakes we make when we cross into a different culture. So the main headings are attitude and proximity. Attitude meaning how hopeful the person is, the optimist who gives the benefit of the doubt and sees the good in something, and the pessimist who tends to notice the problems. Then we have proximity. That's how close a person is in terms of birth, upbringing, or familiarity with a culture. As kids, we tend to start here, close to a culture and optimistic about it. So here's Little Ford with American culture, and I have my toy or my ice cream or whatever. I have no reason to see anything bad, so why question it? Then I get too cool for school as I grow older, and my proximity to the culture introduces me to all of America's dirty laundry, and the next thing you know, I don't see anything good about America. Imagine there's a foreigner out there who sees America from afar, and the only way he's experienced America is through Captain America movies, and he likes them. He thinks they're great. So he's down here. He's got a thimbleful of knowledge about America, but he's suspending disbelief because he doesn't need to see the bad. But then you have the guy from the other side of the world who has only seen Michael Moore movies, which, in case you weren't aware, may be more fictitious than Captain America movies, and I'm only slightly joking. So he sees nothing good in the culture. He hates America. So let's see how this little chart works out when we apply it to very specific cultures. We'll start with a fictitious one that I hope will be familiar to most viewers of this channel. The Jedi of Star Wars, because they're pretty well known. Yoda is too close to the Jedi to realize there's a fundamental problem with the way they are doing things. He has too much faith in his own power. In short, he's cocky, which allows the ever more cynical whiny brat Anakin to distrust him and the entire Jedi Order. The Jedi were too dismissive of human contact and the bonds of love, and that helped propel this hormonal teenager with his disproportionate power right into the arms of the dark side. Luke, meanwhile, in the original 
originals, cannot even believe that the Jedi would do anything wrong. And while his optimism does end up paying off in the end, it's only because Yoda has been duly humbled and because Anakin has, at his core, an attachment to other humans that any sort of balance can come to the Force. Finally, you have Han, everyone's favorite cynic who always shoots first and comes back with quick quips later. He has zero proximity to real Jedi encounters because the only four remaining Force Masters are either walled off in the Halls of Power or hiding in exile. So if he doesn't see it, he doesn't believe it. Now let's take a look at another real life example Hindu culture. In the optimistic camp in India, you have the people who would never ever believe that a Hindu saint could ever do anything wrong, and so they take to the streets in protest if their guru or leader is alleged to have done something bad. And yes, the same thing definitely happens to America. We have these same televangelists or preachers who get found out for something that they've done. And oftentimes the same thing happens. People take to the interwebs and defend them vehemently and say, no, this is, you know, something made up by people who just don't like them and don't respect our culture. I'll stick to Indian Hindu culture for the rest of these examples, but know that in American evangelical Christian culture, the same thing can be said. And probably any religion or any cult microcosmic culture. Then you have the close proximity cynics in India, what the internet has dubbed Adarsh liberals. These are Indians too fed up with their domestic and religious and social ills to see any good in their traditions and heritage. Then you have the optimistic and naive Farangis, which I have represented in this chart by the Beatles. These are hapless hippies who think that because a culture is different and new to them, that it must be better, dude. And then of course you have the colonialist missionaries who resort to words like pagan, dark, and demonic to paint a broad reductionist picture of how backwards and evil the other must be. Now, if we take a look at the motivations of each of these different ways of addressing a culture, we'll see that they have a different why. They have a different reason for approaching or not interacting with the culture at all. The colonialist missionary's why is, I will fix this culture. The hippie is, this culture will fix me. The cynical local is, this culture is too broken to be fixed. And the true believer says, this culture is perfect and will fix everything. And when I started out in my India journey, I was pretty much fully in that last box. I thought I could fix the culture. Culture. I could bring something to India and change it forever. But in my history of interaction with Indian culture, I've been in all of these boxes. Watching Bollywood movies, I've been that clueless foreigner who's fallen in love with the music and the spectacle and was too ignorant of the larger South Asian film culture's history to see the industry's errors. I was too optimistic and naive to see the bad. I've since been on the opposite side of that debate after some attempts at immersing myself in the Bollywood film industry, and I've berated Bollywood for its excess. I was too jaded to see the good. And while I'm no local, there have been moments that even Indians have taken issue with my defenses of India, saying that I'm stunting progress by by refusing to acknowledge or draw attention to India's faults. In one way or another, I've inhabited all of these areas with respect to India. My whys have gone from, I can fix this, to this can fix me, to this can't be fixed, to this needs no fixing, leave it alone. But at the beginning, as a self-important outsider who thought he could fix India and understood India well enough to do so, I needed a bit of humbling. Some guy who is, uh, every time I saw him, he was always asking me for something more. I gave him a camera that he took pictures on. And, uh, but the guy didn't have money to develop it, so I gave him some money to develop it. So he walks me out and he asked for more money. I was thinking, man, the, the money I gave him was enough. So I gave him more. He just keeps demanding something else. He kept talking about a photo or a picture or something. And finally I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And because this was an ongoing process, every time I saw him, he was always saying, do this, do this. I can't understand you. This time I just lost it. I just went off and started yelling at him in the middle of the street. Sachin and one of the other guys, they were just coming back and on Sachin's bike, and they saw me crying, like, what is going on? So Sachin can speak really good English. So he started translating, and the guy was saying, oh, I gave him 300 rupees to develop the film. It was a lie. I gave him much more than 300 rupees. I originally gave him 300, but he asked for more. So I gave him the amount he asked for, and he kept the 300. He didn't give people the 300. I was like, well, he gave me 300 rupees and I was telling him that I was going to give him the film back on Thursday. And I was leaving. I'm leaving tomorrow. But I was really, I don't think he was saying, I want to give you pictures. I was thinking he was saying, I want you to give me a camera. I don't know. Maybe I just read it wrong. And if I did, I lost my temper for nothing. So after an appropriate humbling, that's just part of it. I, I really broke down. Like, I lost it on this guy. Uh, and it was just so weird that the people that drove off the motorcycle were people I knew. That particular experience was a perfect example of the type of humbling that really is required to engage in good cross-cultural communication. And there was more to come. So today I'm looking for the MCD office.
Citizens Service Bureau. Yeah, so today the goal is to get birth certificate for a baby Rohan. I brought as much paperwork as I can foresee needing, but I'm sure I will be short in some way or another. But hey, I could be wrong. So aside from a slight uh, power problem with a hiccup there, five birth certificates. The first one's free, 20 for the other copies. So 80 rupees for five birth certificates that he printed off immediately. I thought it was going to take a week. I thought we were going to have to go through all this time. Word on the street is the Hydra are coming to bless baby Rohan. For those of you who are not familiar, the Hydra are eunuchs in South Asia, are, as Wikipedia describes it, physiologically males who behave as females. Uh, one of the things that they do is to ask for donations when a new baby is born, and they promise a blessing if you give them enough money or curse, and apparently a lot of... Um, ritualistic things that may be done in your yard. Part of the thing is, it's one of the things you don't really know what to do, because historically they've been around so long, and this is part of their livelihood, and so it's kind of like, you don't want to be mean about it, but apparently they can ask for ludicrous amounts of money for this thing, and they said for a foreigner it could go anywhere from 10 to 20 to 50,000 to even 100,000 rupees, which is 2,000 US dollars about. But at the same time, I... I I don't want to just, this is part of their livelihood. I don't really care about their blessing or their cursing. They can do whatever they want. I just, so maybe I can interview them and see if they can tell me some stuff. This may not be a how-to video. This may be a how not to, so we'll see. He's saying the 21,000 to give. Lekin. क्योंकि हमारे लिए जरूरी नहीं है अब यह शक्ति वो भी अंग्रेज़ उसमें भी अंग्रेज़ वो भी देते हैं वो बाहर के हैं अंग्रेज़ वो है ना वो भी दिया मेरे को है ना गोल्ड भी दिया अच्छा वेल लेकिन हमारे पास गोल्ड नहीं है everyone at the front gates telling me to give 10% of what they asked for they asked for 21,000 came down with a thousand and bunches of books and stuff they skewed the books very quickly. Thought that I was giving them Bibles and stuff. I was like, that kind of made me angry, actually. So you just really run through all sorts of conflicting emotions in situations like this. And I think it's actually a good experience to go through because for me, there's no precedent for this. I, I don't really know what to do. I mean, I've dealt with homeless people before, but that is totally a different ball game. You know, these people consider themselves professionals providing a service, and it's a service I don't want, I didn't, don't need, I didn't ask for. This experience happened to me when I'd been in India for two years. And even after that much time and proximity to the culture, I was still squarely in that last box. I still could not understand, appreciate, or see any good in this cultural practice because it was just too different for me. And that was after two years and a lot of humbling. Regarding the cross-cultural mistakes chart, I believe that there is an alternative and it's something I'm calling humble honesty. Someone who shoots for humble honesty is aware of his limitations as both an observer and a participant and he tries to aim for the hopefulness of optimism but employs enough critical thinking so he doesn't ignore a culture's weaknesses. The ideal place is where all four corners meet, a place where an insider or outsider will not be blinded by either the good or the bad, but will choose to acknowledge both and learn from both. I think it's most healthy for an insider who loves his own culture to pay more attention to the criticisms of the culture and see if there's something in them. Maybe there are incremental changes or even drastic overhauls that could make the culture better. I think it's most healthy for an outsider who is studying a new culture to focus on the good things in that culture and see if there's something that could be applied in his own culture, not haphazardly accepting everything with this sort of pie in the sky. Whoop -a doo this will be great. I'll just put this into my own culture, which we tend to call cultural appropriation. But taking time to think through cultural goods and see if his own culture can meet this other culture in some of these areas, or maybe agree to be different, but recognize how the difference could be complementary in the grand scheme of things, instead of just assuming that because it's different, it must be bad. So that's my why today, to discover the good in another culture and see if there are any bad things in my own culture that should be changed. But why India specifically? Because India is the largest democratic nation composed of such a diverse collection of indigenous tribes and ethnicities that practice what Gandhi called Swaraj, self-rule. In almost every other post-colonial land, the native peoples were overrun and conquered by expansionist empires, especially from Europe. 
But here's India, a young nation of one of, if not the, most diverse collections of communities in the world that is ruling themselves. I have learned much in this land that to me has proven to be a cultural crossroad unlike any other I've ever experienced. People say, well, yeah, but you know, now you have the internet and with the number of Indians living overseas, like why do you need to go to India to have this sort of experience? There's something about being on site, the taste of the Golgape, the aroma of chai, the sound of the Kabari wallows, the reverberating thump of Diwali crackers, the push and pull of bartering both old school and new school, and the excitement of crowds at festival time are not virtual experiences. They are real products of thousands of years of human culture that must be sensed on site to be truly understood. We've been in India for four years as a family and we have definitely been humbled, but we've also been invigorated to keep our thirst for cultural adventure alive. And we can't think of a better place to do it than in India. We've got one year left on our visas and we want to make this year the best one yet. And if India would have us back, we would love to do five more. We celebrated our Independence Day here in America this month, and next month India celebrates its Independence Day. So, for our next American Indian episode, we're going to show you how Americans celebrate and Indians celebrate Independence Day. So tune in next month on American Indian for our special Independence Day celebrations. And if you want to know more on my thoughts about living cross-culturally, you can check out my blog, Our Mrs. Sue's on Blogspot, and see what I'm thinking about living life in India. Linked in the description. Please do like, comment, subscribe. And if you like what you see here on American Indian, then consider supporting us on Patreon. If you support us on Patreon, then you get to see these episodes a month in advance. Until next time, keep it cross-cultural. Keep it constructive and creative, YouTube. Thank you very much.